This is Dr. Lauren Lownan, and we're going to talk now about how DNA repair occurs. So we're going to bust this up into three steps for the most part, or um, I just at least want you to know these three steps are always happening, even if um, I don't highlight how each of these steps is happening, like they always have to happen in order for DNA repair to occur. So the cell has to have some way of detecting the damaged DNA, removing the damaged DNA, and then replacing the damaged DNA. Those things have to happen in order for repair to occur. So there are many different kinds of DNA repair systems, and there's variety amongst the different kinds of organisms on the planet, but all of them do have redundancy in their repair systems. Um, and humans have all sorts of DNA repair systems. So there are repair systems that are called proofreading and mismatch repair. And then there are repair systems called direct reversal, excision repair, and double strand break repair. And we're going to look at some of these. So let's think about repair systems that happen during replication of DNA. Okay, so that kind of system, one of the major ways that we repair damage to DNA that's happened during replication is something called proofreading repair. And this is done by DNA polymerase itself. So DNA polymerases are pretty amazing enzymes. They can do synthesis and they can fix mistakes that they make themselves. And so here is um, a strand of DNA that's the template on the bottom. And then up on the top, this is the new strand being copied and it's being copied by adding nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing strand. And there in the background, this like little gray circle is supposed to be DNA polymerase. And so let's say that DNA polymerase is like cruising down this template, building this new strand. And at this position here, what should be happening is a C should be going in, should be base pairing with that G to get the correct copying. And instead, what we see happening is a T is going in. So from time to time, you'll have a faulty nucleotide being added, maybe due to tautomeric shift, maybe just due to like some sort of random event, right? And so if that T gets put in, which has just happened here, it's incorrect, right? And so the DNA polymerase is able to detect that that's a faulty base pairing arrangement. And the way that it de detects that is the fact that a GT base pairing leads to a distortion in the double helix. The width of the double helix is incorrect at this position. That triggers the DNA polymerase to stop and then it will use what's called three to five prime exonuclease activity. And so we talked about nucleases when we learned about um, restriction enzymes in classes. Restriction enzymes are endonucleases, but I mentioned to you that there are also a category of enzymes called exonucleases and that they chop DNA out from the ends. So this is an end and the removal of that thymine was an example of and exonuclease activity, and it's traveling three to five because it's going backwards to synthesis. And DNA polymerase has that ability. So it'll just take that out, and then it will restart and hope that the next time it gets it right, and that here we have a C instead of that C. And that's called proofreading. It happens all the time. Very widespread in nature. Immediately after replication, so just after replication has finished, before the DNA that has just been copied has had a chance to be further processed, for example, by methylation enzymes, we have a system that is called mismatch repair. So if the proofreading function did not catch that error that we were just looking at, and that guanine is actually now in the strand that has been synthesized, and synthesis is all over, but it's just barely finished, we still have a distortion in the double helix at that position where there was an error. And this is the thing, the situation that the mismatch repair proteins recognize. They recognize that distortion. They recognize which strand the problem occurs on because this hasn't had the chance to be methylated yet. And what will happen is the mismatch repair proteins, which are not shown in this figure, but just imagine like a group of proteins working on this, they will come in and they will target that distorted region and they'll yank out a whole bunch of nucleotides right in that region, a whole stretch of them. And that leaves a gap in the strand. And that gap 
looks just like what the enzyme called DNA polymerase 1 in E. coli, and we have a similar one in humans and other animals, recognizes, and it will go in and it will fill in the gap, and then the enzyme DNA ligase will seal the phosphodiester linkages on the outsides of the gap, and then you will have a new corrected strand and due to the work or action of mismatch repair enzymes. There's a system also called direct reversal, and it's a system that's on all the time, so it's not on only during synthesis, and it's not on only immediately after synthesis, it's just on all the time. And this is a protein system that can detect when a nucleotide gets a methyl group or other functional group on it that it should not. And this is like maybe really confusing to hear about because in class I have talked previously about the fact that DNA can be methylated or it can have ethyl groups or other functional groups on it as part of the normal biology of DNA. But it's not willy-nilly that that happens. There are patterns to the methylation that should happen and patterns that should not happen. And so the, the um, direct reversal systems, you can think of them as a set of proteins that will scan for inappropriate methylation. And if inappropriate methylation has happened, which can happen due to exposure to certain harmful chemicals, that methyl group can just be removed or corrected by the direct reversal system. So it's an additional kind of protection system. There's a system called base excision repair that's also constantly active. Um, so it's not linked specifically to replication, but it's like the rest of the time. And if the rest of the time you have some sort of chemical change to a nucleotide that is in an existing strand of DNA. So here we've got a uracil, and you know that uracil should only exist in RNA and not in DNA. And so when you get a chemical reaction called deamination, it can convert a cytosine, a C, into a U. And that's what has happened a moment before here, just due to the chemical environment that this DNA strand was, happen, was experiencing. And that's a fault, and it distorts the double helix. And the base excision repair system can recognize that and what it will do is it will actually come in and it will not yank out a bunch of nucleotides. Instead, it's just gonna yank out the base, the nitrogenous base part of this nucleotide. So it does not mess with the phosphodiester linkages. It's just taking the base out. So it's detected the uracil, which leaves this little like gap. And then what will happen is a moment later, one single nucleotide will be added to that position and the gaps or the bonds then filled in. Tide excision repair. And I know this is a lot of repair systems and I, I warned you about that, right? I said there's redundancy in repair systems. So if you're like, oh, another one, like that's the thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. All these repair systems are what help to keep our genomes intact. So nucleotide excision repair um, can detect in particular these structures that are called thymine dimers. And thymine dimers can be induced by exposure to UV radiation, specifically UV radiation in the UVB category. And so you see these two Ts together. When two Ts are side by side in a strand and a lot of energy comes in in the form of UV light, what can happen is you can get these funky covalent bonds holding the nitrogenous base portions together and therefore interfering in normal base pairing between the, the T's and the A's that they should be base pairing with. And all of that induces this kink or um, dimer structure in the double helix. And that's problematic, it shouldn't be there. The nucleotide excision repair system recognizes thymine dimers. And what it will do is it will grab the thymine dimer containing region and it will yank it out completely. And that that leaves behind a hole, and that hole then gets filled in by DNA polymerase 1, and the gaps get sealed in by the enzyme called ligase. There are more than one system to deal with thymine dimers. And so this photo actually shows you how a thymine dimer can happen. So there's a double helix, UV uh, at the B length wavelengths exposure, 
and the input of energy there, here are two thymine nitrogenous bases side by side, presumably in a double helix, and now they're covalently binding together. And so that is an alteration that will lead to this distortion in the double helix, something called a thymine dimer. And any time, any time we were out getting exposed to UV light, so if we're outside sun tanning or we're just outside going for a hike and our skin is exposed to UV light, thymine dimers are spontaneously forming in the DNA in our skin epithelial cells. And that might sound really, really scary, but remember that we've got this nucleotide excision repair system and then we also have another system that is called photolyase. So the sun's energy, the visible light energy in the sun, will actually turn on an enzyme system called photolyase, and it will reverse these thymine dimers directly. So we have these two systems to handle thymine dimers, nucleotide excision repair and direct reversal through the action of photolyase. So the sun turns on the damage, and the sun also turns on the repair system, which is kind of beautiful from an evolutionary perspective. So now I'm going to talk about what happens when we get a double-stranded break. So far, we've just looked at repair to one of the two strands in a double helix. And I'm going to point out, I'm going to actually jump back to this nucleotide excision repair place as an example of this. But some common things about DNA repair systems are that the cell has to have a way of spotting the damage, and then the, spell, the cell has to have a way of removing the damaged DNA, and then the cell has to have a way of correcting it. And I also said that most DNA repair systems will rely on having a complementary intact and quality strand in order to correct the damage. And so nucleotide excision repair, let's look at this as an example. The distortion in the double helix is how the cell knew there was damage. The cell has proteins that remove the damaged area, and then it uses the complementary strand in order to synthesize new DNA to repair it. And all of these examples we looked at so had looked at so far, it's just one of the two strands that has a problem in it. And unfortunately, sometimes damage can be greater than that. So sometimes you can have damage to DNA that actually breaks the whole double helix. So you've actually you've actually like busted both of the two strands, right? And so unsurprisingly, our cells have ways of coping with this as well. And there are two ways that we're going to look at this thing called non-homologous end joining. And then this thing called homology directed repair or homologous recombination. These are the two ways of dealing with double stranded breaks. So I'm not going to say a lot about them. I just want you to know that there are two, right? Non-homologous end joining means that the cell will use a set of proteins and it will use RecA as one of those proteins, for example, and it will take these two broken ends and it will literally just glue them back together. Very high um, error rate right at the end. So it's very easy to get a mutation or a change in here relative to what this strand was before it was broken. The other thing that can happen in eukaryotic cells, but not prokaryotic cells, is the cell can say, okay, I see this double-stranded break. What I'm gonna do next is, that was one chromosome, and it's broken all the way through. Where is the homologous chromosome? So remember in eukaryotic cells, chromosomes exist as pairs. So this and this, the purple and the red, are the homologous pairs of chromosomes. And the cell is going to reach out and find the homologous pair, and it's going to hold it up as a way to serve as a template to learn and see exactly how to put these broken ends back together. And so when um, the cell uses homology in order to do this, it's called homology-directed repair. And this actually draws on the proteins that are used during routine recombination between homologous chromosomes that occurs during meiosis one in any eukaryotic cell that's going through meiosis. So the cell uses those proteins both for the regular stuff that's happening during meiosis, and also it uses those proteins for this thing called homology-directed repair, or HDR, through homologous recombination. When it uses this intact strand 
then what happens is there's less error in the repair. So this tends to be a lot more precise. So if you can provide the cell with a template of what the chromosome should look like, then it will use that template and it will have fewer errors in the repair process. And I'm gonna ask you guys to really remember this because in order to understand the system called CRISPR, you have to, you have to get this point, okay? This is really, really important, okay? You have to get the fact that non-homologous end joining repair is a way to fix double-stranded breaks that results in a lot of errors. And that homology-directed repair, or HDR, is a way to fix double-stranded breaks that uses a homologous molecule in order to have fewer errors on the other side. Okay? And it turns out that when we're genetically manipulating cells, Sometimes we want to do a repair with few errors, and sometimes we want to do a repair that on purpose has a lot of errors. And we'll get to that when we learn about CRISPR, but I want you to note that for now. I also want to uh, bring up the topic of the so-called breast cancer genes while we're on the topic of DNA repair. So the genes uh, that we could be screened for to see if we are predisposed to having breast cancer are called the breast cancer genes. And it's a bit of a faulty name because like all human beings have these genes, the question is whether we have alleles for those genes that are associated with cancer or not. So when we get sequenced to test for that predisposition uh, to cancer, what's happening is we're screening to see which alleles of the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes that we have. Some of those alleles are problematic and are associated with having high rates of cancer and others are not. It turns out that both these genes encode uh, proteins for um, double-stranded break repair by homologous recombination. So this system right here, right? The breast cancer genes are involved in this kind of DNA repair. If you don't do the repair properly, then you will have higher rates of cancer. If you do the repair properly, you will have lower rates of cancer. And so, those are genes that are involved in that particular DNA repair system. The final point that I want to make about DNA repair is that in general, if you don't have appropriate DNA repair systems, there will be consequences to it. So there is a genetic disorder called xeroderma pigmentosum, and this um, young girl has that particular condition. And whenever she goes out in the sun, she has to cover every single part of her body to protect herself from UV light. And that's because she has defects in her nucleotide excision repair pathway. So she cannot correct thymine dimers using that repair system. And that means that she's really susceptible to damage from the sun. And here's a lesion on her nose that is due to that damage. And then there are like less harmful or less severe looking lesions elsewhere on her face where she cannot protect her skin from that damage. So the best protection she's got is covering at all times. And with that, that concludes this uh, short lecture on DNA repair.